Hello and welcome to Dementia Unplugged. I'm Janine Forrest and I'll be facilitating this discussion today on Down syndrome and dementia. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your, out of your days uh, uh, to spend time with me to talk about this uh, important conversation that not many people know about, Down syndrome and dementia. <clears throat> So before we get started, we'd like you to hear a message from the president of the Dementia Society of America, Kevin Jamison. Welcome. Please listen to this important message from the Dementia Society of America. All content, including any potential medical information, is provided as an informational resource only and is not to be used or relied on for any diagnostic or treatment process. It should not be used as a substitute for professional diagnosis, care, and treatment. Please consult your health care provider before making any health care decisions or for guidance about a specific medical condition. The opinions expressed and the content shared by Dr. Forrest are not necessarily of the opinions and content of the Dementia Society of America. Thank you. So if you're new to Dementia Unplugged, just wanted to let you know that basically um, I give a little presentation and talk for about 30 minutes, and then we open it up to a question and answer that you can submit through the chat button on, on your computers. We also start by uh, having me go over what the word dementia really is. So I wanna make sure we're sort of on the same page, we're speaking the same language. So the, de the word dementia is really an umbrella term. <clears throat> and there are many, many different types of uh, what we call etiologies or conditions or diseases um, that represent different types of dementias. So like the word cancer, there can be prostate, breast, uh, you know, lung cancer. So there are close to 400 different conditions right now that we're aware of that um, really um, show characteristics and signs of a dementia. In general, most of the dementias are progressive and terminal at this point in time. The most common that you're probably familiar with is the Alzheimer's uh, disease, dementia, and then there's vascular, mixed dementia, Lewy body, frontal temporal. Today, uh, we're going to talk about um, a dementia that is probably most similar to the Alzheimer's type. And that is related to people who um, have an underlying condition and are born with a condition called Down syndrome. A little background on, on that. Uh, Down syndrome was, um, the characteristics were sort of codified by a physician named John Langdon Down in about 1866. And he sort of saw a, sort of a, a pattern of features uh, within individuals who were born with this condition. It really wasn't until about the 1950s where there was the genetic component that was identified as being sort of the, the cause for this problem. So a person with Down syndrome is born with an extra copy of a particular chromosome, number 21. We all carry 23 chromosomes in pairs, but for whatever reason, and that's still uh, under research, the person with Down syndrome, otherwise known as trisomy 21, is born with three copies of <clears throat> the number 21 chromosome. And so how that translates is there are definitive sort of uh, facial uh, features that are common to people with this condition. Uh, a smaller head, 
uh, short nose, flat upper part of the nose, thin upper lip, the folds of the skin between the eyes and the nose are different. And, and, and so there are these um, more visible kind of characteristics. In addition, there are intellectual uh, uh, sequelae to this uh, disease. And, and so the impact is also on learning, language, and memory. In addition to sort of the facial and other bodily uh, features, uh, there are internal physical uh, problems that accompany Down syndrome as well. And most commonly, people born with Down syndrome also have uh, heart defects, uh, impaired bones and muscles, problems with vision and hearing. And all in all, the average life expectancy for people with Down syndrome is about 60 years. There have been advances over the years uh, in better treatment in terms of heart disease, things like that but the average lifespan is still more limited than people without this condition. I wanna say that <clears throat> the advances in the care of people with Down syndrome have made it such that there's an enormous community of, of, of care providers and practitioners and community support and families family members who have worked so diligently, so hard to create quality of, of life, meaningful life skills for people uh, with this condition. And um, families have, have struggled over the years to be advocates for people with intellectual disabilities. And, you know, there's just a lot in my experience, there's been nothing but, you know, sort of love and encouragement and promotion and hope that the person can be as independent and in, uh, in life as possible, given all of the challenges. <clears throat> With that background in mind, now, now comes the combination or the intersection of a, a type of dementia that is happening for people, particularly over the age of 40 and 50, who also have um, lived with Down syndrome. So estimated uh, prevalence right now is about 50 to 80% of people with Down syndrome develop some form of a dementia that is similar to the disease. And we're, we're seeing evidence of this that starts at about age 50, maybe about 30%. And then that really escalates when someone turns the age of 60 with Down syndrome. Uh, roughly 80% of people convert or now develop some form of this dementia. So the suspected underlying mechanisms for what we call early onset dementia before um, the age of 65 has to do with particular um, sort of genes uh, that uh, this person in inhibits. Uh, there's a particular gene called the protein amyloid precursor, uh, and I don't want to get too technical here, but it's also known as the APP gene. This seems to build up by the age of 40 for people with Down syndrome. And this particular gene, uh, when you have a, a buildup, seems to be developing more plaques and tangles within the brain, which are these substances, these sort of sticky cells that glue together and disrupt the normal processing of information. More recently, uh, with additional research, there seems to be other uh, reasons for why this person with Down syndrome seems to now developing a dementia. And it has to do with sort of a disruption of the metabolic functions, uh, 
looking at inflammation uh, may also be a particular um, uh, cause for why there seems to be such uh, an escalation of, of, of an aging brain. And unfortunately, uh, for people with Down syndrome, their development of the dementia, when it does happen, seems to have a much more rapid decline, or a rapid pace and decline. Uh, if you're looking at the screen, I just wanted to show you in terms of visual, uh, sort of the outline of what uh, um, a tangle is, neurofibrillary tangle, and an amyloid plaque. Uh, these are, are the particular cells that are developing in clusters. Um, on the left side, you see a, a slide um, of brain cells. And literally, this is what disrupts sort of the neural uh, communication, the transmission of information uh, and electrical impulses and communication of ideas and things like that that happen within the brain normally. We now have an incredible disruption, which explains the changes in the brain and function and, and, and cognitive skills. I'm also showing you a picture uh, in this next slide of an MRI. Um, it shows a healthy brain. On, on, we're looking at the left uh, half of the slide. And on the right side, you see a dense, uh, dense tissues. The, the, the brain literally fills the cranium. And there's an arrow pointing to the what's called the hippocampus. That's an area that is um, responsible for recording of our information. If you look to the left, you, you see a sort of a blank space because there's an erosion of, of that hippocampus, which uh, then explains why people cannot learn new information because the information is not recorded into the midbrain. On the right side of the, uh, of the screen, it's just showing you sort of a, a drawing and, and it's a little easier to see sort of the, what we call the vacuoles or the holes within the brain are the developing. So <clears throat> when the brain is becoming more and more um, impacted, there are problems with language and memory and behavior. And not only that, but um, the brain controls all functions of the body, including motor skills, the ability to walk and to talk. Ultimately, people lose the ability um, to have fine motor skills and ultimately the ability to swallow. So just like people without uh, Down syndrome, um, what's required is a full medical evaluation. And what's um, particularly important is that the person with Down syndrome has what we call an informant interview, meaning there needs to be a person who knows that person well, uh, knowing their sort of baseline uh, intellectual abilities and their ability to be social. Because the person with Down syndrome, what we're, what we're finding is they have a little less insight into the fact that anything wrong is, is taking place. And so they're less apt to be aware that they're having problems with their own memories. So that's why it's important to have someone who knows them more intimately in order to give a better description of, of sort of the changes from the outside in. So in addition to this uh, informant, what, what's happening is the medical community is trying to rule out any kind of underlying medical condition that could potentially explain some of these changes. And some of those problems include um, an underactive thyroid, hypothyroidism, can often mimic a, a dementia or a severe depression, uh, brain tumors, um, infections, particularly uh, that may occur within the ears and sinuses of, of, of people uh, with Down syndrome. So a whole slew of, of lab work and an MRI are, are, are done in order to rule out, again, any other 
uh, competing um, explanation for why these changes are taking place. Because of this phenomenon that's happening with people with Down syndrome, it's now recommended that a screening uh, start for some form of dementia uh, starting at the age of 35 and then routine follow-ups um, years after because of the of the increasing prevalence here. So that you know that's that's different than um, you know the rest of the population where we may see some of the changes later in life um, and especially as we move towards uh, the 80s, 80, 90, 85 years of age. So what are we seeing? What's different? So here we have someone who has pre-existing uh, intellectual uh, difficulties. And so the changes that take place are a little bit different. What you're going to see are first changes in personality. Uh, the person uh, living with Down syndrome would be often less social, less enthusiastic. Uh, all of a sudden, maybe not being able to perform routine familiar tasks or um, if, if they were in a working environment, being less productive. In addition, you may see some uh, sadness or anxiety or irritability difficulty paying attention. The other part that's um, somewhat, I don't want to say completely unique, but there seems to be a more of a consistent pattern of, of developing adult onset seizures uh, with this type of dementia. So those are the sort of clusterings. So if you are a family member or a member of a care community, a supportive living environment, those are the types of changes that you want to, you know, uh, have your ears and antennae open to. These are sort of the red flags and start journaling, looking for patterns, not just sort of um, just episodic events of these. Because families have faced a long struggle of, of sort of medical issues from the time the person was born, uh, it's been a long trajectory of, of health issues to consider. And as, we, as I explain, it has taken a, a whole village of, of support and enthusiasm and education uh, to bring the person to a point where they can be as in independent and functional as possible. And the whole you know, point is, is, is to improve quality of life. Now, it almost can feel out of the blue that all of this work is now suddenly just, they're losing ground. And the, and the families and the care communities need to learn how to adapt to this sort of new normal and to support a decline while supporting quality of life. And this has not been easy for care communities. Um, I can remember visiting uh, places here in, in, particularly in Chicago, uh, where whole um, staff were trained to make the person as independent as possible. And now uh, the challenge is to accommodate different ways of, of supporting that person. And, and so this has been particularly difficult in, in these uh, situations, but not, um, not impossible. So what are some of the care strategies to consider, especially in the earlier uh, stages of, of this disease? Well, I can't tell you enough how important it is to get as much education and support and self-care for however you are a, a care provider, whether that be a, a family member or if you are working in a community situation to learn more and to get your own support because it's gonna take energy um, and uh, patience and the ability uh, to provide care in a way that um, 
that doesn't test your patience and, and frustration. So you're going to learn to communicate differently. Uh, we are all as compassionate as can be, but uh, working with people with uh, Down syndrome, uh, it's going to take even more uh, emphasis on communicating in a loving and supportive way. Ways we can do that is, is not taking away work, but breaking down tasks into smaller steps so that they're more doable and it may take more repeat explanation in small chunks. We still want to support independence as much as possible, uh, look for uh, potential uh, problems with safety, and um, really have a sense of security for that person. In this time, it's really important for the informants or the care providers to get a sense of what what is important to this person? What are their likes? What's their favorite foods? How do they like to spend their time? What's their dislikes? Uh, what's their love language? Meaning, do they like hugs, gifts, uh, praises of affirmation, spending time? Write that down because over time when they lose the ability to articulate this on their own, it, the onus is on us, the care providers, to continue loving them in the way that they prefer to be loved. And although difficult um, to consider, uh, especially in the early stages, it's imperative to start looking at um, issues of guardianship particularly if there are no family members who are available uh, and who are, are, are meeting this need and looking at advanced care planning. I, I want to spend a little more time again on what I mean by communicating compassionately. We communicate in three different ways, our body language, tone of voice, and words. And you may know this intuitively, but it's our body language and tone of voice that communicate more than our choice of words. Uh, there's a, a little bit of a spectrum here with some smiley faces and uh, someone who's frowning and neutral and smiling. Um, obviously, this, the, the smiley faces are not saying a word but you can uh, um, sort of uh, grab onto the meaning of what those faces mean. That's what I mean in terms of communicating compassionately. The way we look and our tone of voice needs to be congruent, especially for people who have intellectual disabilities because words may not always make sense, but we can communicate our love in this very strong and passionate way. So the onus is on us to take care of ourselves in order for this to happen. So you may say with words, I'm fine, but the tone of voice comes across stressed or not true and sincere. So when I talk about strategies of care, I, I place the caregivers first because what you, how you care for yourself is, uh, it spills over to the people you care for. As we move in this progressive disease to the middle stages, I'm gonna share with you some of the um, changes that take place. So you'll see more obvious decline in mental functioning, more challenges performing day-to-day -day tasks and self-care skills. You may see more fluctuations in mood, uh, not only is short-term memory um, impaired, uh, know that long-term uh, memory still exists, but that will eventually fade as we move towards later stages. More difficulty with um, time and place, getting lost in familiar places. Here is where language starts to become more impacted and uh, the person may use less words or mix up words. And so it's the onus again is on us to pay attention to the underlying tone and how they're communicating 
to us, look at their body language, tone of voice, expressions, and you can glean sort of the feelings if they're frustrated or angry or sad or happy or joyful. You'll see someone have less insight into what's safe or not. And as we move towards middle stage, there'll be urinary incontinence, uh, so the motor changes start to take place. So there'll be difficulty with balance and walking. I want to interject here and say what's particularly helpful is our communication less through words and more through the senses. So spending time singing together, humming, listening to music, communicating through the arts, meaning through drawing or, or painting or dancing or um, through the senses, uh, smelling beautiful flowers together, tasting um, special treats like chocolate. So think about all of the senses, uh, what you're smelling and tasting and, 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 and feeling and experience the world through the senses together. Just remembering that the brain is changing when uh, people with Down syndrome and now with dementia become more easily frustrated. Understand that this is really uh, the cells in the brain are changing. No one's doing this on purpose. And it's easy to forget that because the person still looks the same from the outside. And yet, uh, you know, if we had x-ray eyes, we could see that the brain tissue is, is really changing. So what becomes important is routine and structure to navigate through the day. Uh, having less surprises seems to ease some of the uh, easy triggers in terms of, of maybe irritability. Avoid overstimulation and fatigue because that can often lead to anxiety and distress. Uh, build in times just for the person to have quiet time. Uh, make sure it's not overly stimulating with loud TVs or background noise. Uh, the brain needs to rest throughout the day. In terms of care strategies, it's, it, it's on us to anticipate the physical and, and, and emotional needs. Uh, that's why it's so important to know that person, getting down their likes and dislikes. So if I know that Mary has enjoyed cream in her coffee, uh, she shouldn't have to tell me, I should just bring it to her um, in a way that she prefers. What's, uh, what's different or unique to this population is they already have often ongoing medical needs that can become more complex uh, because they're less able to articulate perhaps symptom changes in terms of pain. So look towards changes in baseline behavior or escalation in um, confusion. You can have an underlying dementia, but if all of a sudden there's a severe escalation within hours uh, that may more uh, indicate that an infection is taking place. Uh, we still want to continue uh, to have the person uh, be in, in with others um, and, and encourage their socialization. Uh, this is not a time to keep people uh, completely alone. And all the time looking at dignity and uh, fostering independence in whatever way, shape, or, uh, you know, that, that's possible. So if, if, if someone is taking a shower, you just don't want to do it for them completely. Offer the washcloth, have them wash their face, praise them um, in whatever capacity is possible. The environment also plays a role. We want to make sure that the lighting is adequate, that we have adequate grab bars in the, in the showers um, or handrails as someone's ability to walk changes over time. 
As we move towards late stage, this is when uh, people really require total assistance with things like dressing, toileting, hygiene, feeding, uh, much less, immo you know, much more immobility uh, or decreased mobility. So we, we want to make sure that their skin stays intact and no, no uh, pressure sores. Here is where we uh, begin to lose both short and long term memory. And what's most important is the very present moment. Speech uh, may uh, be limited to just a few words or sounds. A uh, person becomes totally incontinent with bladder and bowel. And as I said earlier, because the brain controls all, all of our functions, including our muscles, people begin to lose the ability to chew and swallow, and they begin to aspirate food and fluid into the lungs. And this is really how the dying process starts. So for care strategies, it really does take um, sort of a, a community of care providers. One person cannot do this all. Um, this is when we introduce or continue things like um, what we would call uh, pleasure feedings. Um, and and if, if, if spiritual support has been of importance to certainly continue that. I wanna mention the hospice criteria for advanced dementia, which is the same whether someone has um, Down syndrome or not. The only caveat here is that we would look towards uh, more seizure activity. So um, <clears throat> for people with the advanced stages of dementia, the criteria include this, the, the dementia is progressing, they require assistance with ambulation or walking and dressing and bathing. Um, incontinent of both bowel and bladder, can speak less than six words or no consistent meaningful conversation. And, and we have to really consider how, how that has changed in light of the fact of what their baseline uh, abilities were. This is where we may have unintentional weight loss of 10% of the body in the past six months. Recurrent infections like a bladder infection or a pneumonia or pressure ulcer and frequent falls. So this, is, this does not mean someone is completely bed bound, um, but uh, this gives you a picture of when hospice can be introduced to provide support for the entire uh, family um, in addition uh, to the person with Down syndrome and dementia. As we move towards um, end of life care, what, what, what seems to take place often because uh, people often have multiple underlying uh, other health problems like uh, cardiac uh, deficits, there's a more sudden decline towards death. Um, and, and there's a whole, you know, this could be a whole other program in terms of, of, of looking at end of life wishes. But uh, we want to make sure that the person who is, is, is helping to make these decisions certainly knows and loves that person well. Uh, we may not have ever um, had a conversation about what they want at end of life because of capacity in the past. But um, this really speaks to educating the families on the benefits and the verse, uh, burdens of aggressive medical treatment. Um, you know, because we have different treatment doesn't always make it better. And so comfort, the goal of comfort is often um, um, sort of the, the focus and end of life. I also want to stress that we want to support the community members um, if they're living within a supportive living environment that uh, as, as someone's dying, it not only certainly impacts the, the immediate family and caregivers, but the people around them. So that said, um, we certainly have uh, much to learn in terms of Down syndrome and, and, and dementia. Uh, this is an area of research 
uh, as we see how different uh, proteins are accumulating in the brain, perhaps it can give us more insight uh, as to why people without Down syndrome um, are experiencing some form of, of dementia. Um, because having the existence of this protein in the plaques and the tangles does not always translate into a dementia. So what's the difference between having this and going on to dementia and having the plaques and tangles and not? You know, that's, that's the great question here. But please know that there's the National Down Syndrome Society that uh, wrote a guideline in working with people uh, with Down syndrome and dementia. It's a little dated, uh, 2009, but still good information. And um, there are various consortiums that are working together uh, to really um, investigate this whole uh, combination of, of Down syndrome and, and dementia and how to support the wider community. So we're learning to care. We're learning to care given the current situation before finding the cure or in fact, it may be cures. If any of you would like uh, a one-to-one -one, uh, sort of hired consultation, you can always contact me through uh, dementiacoachoncall.com or 773-704-1834. And I'd be happy to speak with you about your particular situation. I also want to thank the Dementia Society of America, who sponsors and hosts Dementia Unplugged. Um, our uh, sessions are recorded, and you can find a whole library of past recordings uh, through the Dementia Society of America. And on that note, um, I want you to start thinking of questions if you have them. And I'm going to end the recording in order to keep uh, our privacy and, and we'll talk off, you know, without being recorded. But for those of you, I just want to thank you for your attention.